Good morning. God bless you for being here this morning. And I'd like to ask you to please stay for just a little while after our services are done so where we can make you feel as welcome as you are. Good place to begin always is with prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Blessed be you, almighty God, maker of the heavens and the earth. How high and how holy is your name. Father, just now we ask your guidance as we study what you have revealed to us. I pray that these words will be true. I pray that they shall be easily understood and bring glory to you and our Lord Jesus, in whose name I pray. Electronics do not like me. So, do you know how to, is this turned on? Is it? <clears throat> okay, the bottom. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I once heard it said that if you can't be smart, you should marry smart. That's why I married my wife. We live in a dangerous time. Morality is failing in plain sight. And Christians, moral people, are being told you have to go along with it. What's a Christian to do? Our study this morning involves a must-know passage because it will help us to give glory to God in a world that is evolving from Christian to post-Christian to anti-Christian thoughts and practices. Let me define what I mean by these things, okay? An illustration. Christian marriage is a covenant between one man and one woman for life. Post-Christian marriage is between two people who love each other regardless of their sex. Anti-Christian, you've got to go along with that. Another illustration, Christian definition, there are only two genders, male and female. Post-Christian, male and female are at either ends of a long line. And along that line, there could be as many as 30 other genders. It all depends on how you feel or what you think of yourself. Anti-Christian, you've got to go along with that. So how does a Christian live in that kind of a world? There's four lessons, all in Acts chapter 4, that will answer that question. So if you don't mind, if you have your Bibles with you, please be turning to Acts chapter 4. We'll be there in just a minute. This chapter brings us to what I will call a pre-Christian era. That means that the world was just now beginning to learn about and hear about and feel the effects of Christianity and powerful, influential people were opposed to it. What we're about to see is that the world that we are facing today is not really different than the world that the apostles were facing then. What they were facing then, we're facing now. Therefore, I think that it is 
just absolutely obvious that there's going to be some things that we can glean, that we can learn from what the apostles were dealing with because we're dealing with those very same things. That's why I think that Acts chapter 4 is a must know, a go-to passage of scripture, especially, especially today. Back in Acts chapter 3 that John just read, Peter and John go to the temple. A lame man was there and he was begging. And as Peter and John walk by, he begs from them. Peter says, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I freely give to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, walk. And he did. The man went his way rejoicing, but not for very long. There were others there, those influential people who weren't rejoicing very much. Peter and John are brought before the leaders of the people. Some of these leaders were involved in the crucifixion of Jesus just a few months previously. So that brings us to Acts chapter 4. Begin with me in verse 1. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the morrow, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. On the morrow, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem with Amos, the high priest, Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a cripple, by what means this man has been healed, be it known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. Notice that the influential leaders, the leaders of the people, were annoyed at what just happened. Why are they annoyed? Look at verse 2. Verse 2 says, They are annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. In verse 3, we see that Peter and John are arrested for that. Verse 5, the next day, they are brought before the authorities. And here's what I would call an arraignment, a reading of the charges. Look at verse 7. We're giving you a chance. Here's the time where you can change your mind if you want to. But in verse 7, they say, By whom did you do this? Verse 10, It was Jesus who you crucified and who, raised, who, and who rose from the dead by him. This man is standing before you well. Verse 11. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, but which has become the head of the corner. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which men must be saved. How do the leaders respond? Peter and John spoke in the name of Jesus and that annoyed 
some influential people. Does that sound familiar? And the leaders respond almost identically to how many leaders respond today. Look at the next verse, verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they wondered and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. So what's the first lesson we can learn from this? The leaders respond first by marginalizing the apostles, by marginalizing, that is, that they try to confine the apostles to a small, insignificant group, a group that should have no voice. By saying that Peter and John were uneducated, common men, that's not true, but it is a put down show you what I mean. It's because of what they believed they were considered to be uneducated. They are not. Peter and John were fishermen before they came to Jesus. They had been engaged in business. They could read, they could write, between the two of them, they gave us seven books of the New Testament. They are not uneducated. This phrase, uneducated, common men, does not mean that they had no education, that they had been to school. It means that they did not attend the right Therefore, they did not have the right education. In the end of verse 13, the authorities recognized that they had been with Jesus. They don't deserve to be heard. They've been listening to him. These same authorities spent months to try to rid the country, the people of Jesus. And these men are known to have been his students. As a result of being with Jesus, they don't have the right allegiance. They don't have the right education. They don't deserve to be heard. They're marginalized. I figure today, you can go to Harvard, some other elite school, and it doesn't matter what subjects you take. It doesn't matter how good you do with your grades. You can study the hardest subjects, get the best grades, but I can almost guarantee you that what you have to say is going to be discounted are marginalized if you are identified as having been with Jesus. There are whole denominations today who embrace the LGBT agenda even in their clergy. And these denominations are considered to be popular they're considered to be with the program. And those other people, those other people who believe in the sovereignty of God, who believe in the integrity and the authority of the scriptures, they're uneducated. They are narrow-minded bigots. They don't deserve to be heard. So lesson number one, the apostles were not marginalized. We may be called common, uneducated people too, but we, we will not be marginalized. We also serve a risen 
Jesus. Another lesson that's flowing out of the pre-Christian era of Peter and Peter and, and John to our anti-Christian era is that neutrality is not an option. Verse 14. But seeing that the man had been healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. What were they going to say? What could they say? The man, the man is standing right here beside them. The authorities say, how did you do this? The apostles say, oh, we healed him in the name of Jesus. No, you didn't. Who's standing here? What could they say in opposition? See, the leaders are thinking something different here. Look at this, beginning in verse 15. But when they had commanded them to go outside and out of the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is manifest to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. The leaders here are thinking, we, We've got to do something. We can't let this alone. This man is indeed standing there. So never mind the evidence. We have just got to find a way to shut these people up. Again, I asked, does that sound familiar? Christians, it's an illusion. It's just not reality to think that we can be neutral. As if to say, if we just keep our heads down, if we just keep our faith to ourselves, we mind our own business, if we just go to church, if we just do that, these other people will just leave us alone. But they won't. They won't. It's now demanded more and more that we bend the knee to Caesar. Folks, I don't know the words. We think we can be neutral if we think that the world is just going to leave us alone. We have adolescence, grade school, boys and girls who are being taught gender care as they transition from one gender to another. And this is without parental knowledge or consent. Suppose it's your daughter who's on your school's volleyball team and the other side has a boy on the girl's team because he thinks he's a boy. And this boy spikes the ball so hard into your daughter's face that she crumbles to the ground with a concussion. What if Caesar tells us, oh, there's a pandemic. The bars can stay open. Strip joints can stay open. You can riot. But churches, no, you've got to close. I have learned within the past few months that this congregation had options. This congregation stayed open during COVID. And it was a matter of you being able to make a choice whether or not you wanted to assemble here or online. God bless you for giving the people 
a choice. I think you're to be commended for that. But the anti-Christian world in which we live not only actively denies the existence of God, that Jesus is the Christ, and that the Bible is the word of God, but that anti-Christian world also compels us to deny those same things. We cannot proclaim a belief in a God who was and who is and who is to come without causing a clash with those who demand that we be silent. Peter and John did not stay neutral. We cannot stay neutral. Verse 17. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. Did you catch what the leaders did not say? They did not say, don't heal anymore. They said, just don't do it in the name of Jesus and don't speak about his resurrection. The leaders then are just trying to cover up the resurrection and the power of Jesus. Does that happen at all today? Have you seen what happens when a person is to give a speech at a high school or a college or some kind of a convention? Well, you can quote Buddha how wise you are. You can quote Muhammad, oh, you really are well, well-rounded. But quote Jesus, separation of church and state, you can't mention that name. You can use any name you want to, but not the name of Jesus. Why? Why is there such a problem? The name of Jesus because Jesus makes a rather unique claim. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. And his resurrection proved that he is the Son of God and that he had the authority to make the claims that he did. But don't use that name. He's way, way too narrow-minded. Sound familiar? Many then, and many today are demanding, don't use that name. Lesson number two, we cannot be neutral. Verse 19 gives us the third similarity between Acts 4 and now, and it gives us the third lesson. Verse 19, But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge. Now stop right there. The third lesson is the response that we get from Peter and John. Our response should be exactly the same. Look at verse 19 again. Oh, because you have declared that we are not to teach or preach any more in the name of Jesus, then we will try to do the best we can by our lifestyle. Is that what your Bible says? No. That's not what mine says either. So again, 
Let's read verse 19, but let's do it the right way. Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. Stop. We'll read the rest of it in a minute. There's a two-part response here. Whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, here's some key words. You must judge. Look back at verse 8. Look at the respect shown to their leaders. Verse 8 says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders. Catching that? You notice that there's no belittling, there's no put downs, there's no name calling, only respect. And folks, we're Christians. We're trying to live in an anti-Christian world. But we are also in the, in the throes of a very, very nasty political season. So let me just take a little bit of a detour. Peter and John said, rulers of the people and elders. They were so respectful. There's a lesson here. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17. This same Peter would say, honor the emperor. Respect. Paul, in Romans chapter 13, would say there is no authority except for that which has been instituted by God. Jesus himself, whenever he was being tried by unrighteous people, he didn't call anybody names. He didn't belittle anybody. He was still respectful. So in a day, in an age, in a specific time in this country where it's so easy to get on the email or TikTok or whatever those things are and to belittle different political candidates because they do not believe what you believe in, be very, very careful. Don't be disrespectful because we can be found in opposition to that which God has instituted. Be careful with your language. Peter and John acknowledge higher authority. They recognize that the authorities have a decision to make. And it is within their right to make that decision. Peter and John say you have a decision to make. That brings us to the second part. We have a decision to make too. And brothers and sisters, this is how a Christian should respond in an anti-Christian world. Look at verse 20, the rest of it. We cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. You want us to stop teaching in his name. But we cannot unsee what we've seen. We cannot unhear what we've heard. This man is standing right here who couldn't walk for 40 years. And now he can walk. And it's by the power of the name that you're telling us not to use. My decision? We can't do that. Lesson number three, we will respond as did Peter and John. We are going to speak in the name of Jesus. This brings us face to face with what people did then and what they'll do today 
when they cannot silence the truth. And that is, they are going to resort to threats. Verse 21. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all men praised God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. How would you like to be the man who had to threaten the apostles? I'm warning you, I'm warning you, don't preach any more in that name. And you go back to the authorities who told you to do that. They say, did you warn them? Say, yeah, I warned them. What did they say? They said, no. What am I supposed to do now? Go back, threaten them some more. Now remember, it's not just Peter and John who are standing there. There's that man who's been lame, plus there are 5,000 men who were hell bound, but are now on their way to glory because of the name of Jesus. No, we are not going to stop preaching and teaching in his name. You stop preaching, you stop preaching, or we're going to take away all your earthly possessions. Oh, okay. Remember? Remember what happened in Acts chapter 2? They gave away all their earthly possessions. Peter had just said, silver and gold, I have none. But what I do have, I'll give to you. We'll take away all your earthly possessions. Took care of that over in Acts chapter 2. You quit preaching in that name or we're going to beat you. What happens in Acts chapter 5? They are beaten. What happens after that? They get the disciples together and they rejoice that they had been found worthy to suffer in the name of Jesus. You stop preaching in that name or we're, or we're going to kill you. Yeah, like, like you killed him? You killed him. But God raised him up. How do you threaten the power of an almighty God? In a world that is anti-Christian, a world that compels us more and more to bend the knee to Caesar, let's remember, brothers and sisters, we've got to remember that we have been with Jesus. Therefore, we will not be marginalized. We will not be neutral. We will respond just like Peter and John, regardless of the threats. That's, that's how a Christian lives in an anti-Christian world. God bless you. May God strengthen us in this strength, in this struggle for his glory. And thank you for listening. We, we, we should pray. Blessed be you, almighty God. How high how holy is your name. Father, I pray that these words in the meditations of our hearts have been acceptable to you. 
We live in a dreadful time, Father. But help us to know that you, you rule the nations. As your plans for our country and the nations unfold, we want to be known as having been with Jesus. Help us not to be silent and to speak of the name of Jesus everywhere as you give us life. For I bring this prayer to your feet in the precious name of our Lord Jesus. sovereign and all-powerful God of the universe does not compel people to follow him. Instead, he invites people into his family. We enter this family by understanding that there is an authority above us we repent of our lives as we have lived them in such a way to think that we have been the authority. But we repent of that and we change our lives with the help of Almighty God. We are baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. We are raised to walk in the newness of life. We are now walking in the light. We are a part of God's family. If it is your desire this morning to be baptized, we can take care of that. We can help you, and we would love to be able to do that. Perhaps there are those here who are already members of God's family. And sometimes you know the burden gets heavy. There are temptations. There's troubles at work, sometimes troubles at home, sometimes the road gets rough. I know that too. Sometimes there's things that you want to rejoice over, all of these things. Share these things with us so where we can pray with you, we can pray for you. And if there are those here this morning who want to study more about the name and the power and the authority and the beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to study with you. 